right. Hello, everybody. Today is uh, June 20th, 2024. This is another working group batch meeting. Um, a quick reminder, this is being recorded and to adhere to the CNCF code of conduct. Um, with that all out of the way, let me quickly share my screen for the agenda. Um, we have three topics. Um, I think the presenter for K Foundry is not here unless somebody else can represent. Mm. All right. Uh, so, but we can, I can see the presenter for Skypilot is here. So we can move on to that topic. And if Eduardo comes later, we can give him some minutes. So, Romil, do you need uh, to share your screen at all? I can, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll share my screen. So just before I start, like how much time should I expect to take? So uh, let's say about 20 minutes. Okay, uh, perfect. If, if Eduardo shows up, if he doesn't show up, you can take 30. Yeah, okay. if no one else shows up, just we take the whole thing though. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so let me, give you permissions for presenting. Mm -hmm. All right, now you should have permissions to, to share your screen. Okay, yeah, perfect. Let me set this up. Uh, okay, excellent. Uh, can you guys see my slides? Yes. Perfect. Uh, okay, thanks, thanks everyone for taking the time to join today. Uh, I'm Romel. I'm a postdoc here at UC Berkeley, and previously I was a PhD student here at UC Berkeley. I worked on everything related to distributed systems, and more recently we've, we've been working on this project called SkyPilot, where the idea is to sort of run AI on any infrastructure. Um, again, this is an open source project. Um, you can install it right away. Pip install SkyPilot, or just check out our GitHub. Uh, so in the interest of time, I'll, the way I'll structure this, so I want this to be interactive. So if you guys have any questions, thoughts in the middle, just interrupt at any point. I'll take a few minutes to just introduce SkyPilot and the overarching problem, and then I'll go to Kubernetes specific details and queue specific details that might be of more interest. So uh, like our thesis with SkyPilot really is that running AI on the cloud is difficult and expensive. Uh, and let me give an example. For instance, if you try to do a typical AI workflow today, right? For an AI engineer, it's really hard because first they have to pick between three different clouds. They have to choose between multiple regions. Um, there may be many zones within these regions where they may want to run. And then once they have decided the location, they also need to choose what exact GPUs they want to run on. Once they have sort of like chosen the location and the resources that they need, they must then provision these resources, right? Uh, so they might go to AWS and they're like, hey, I need one V100 GPU. Um, then they need to transfer the data. The data sets might be in a different region on, or they need to transfer the code that they have on their machines to this remote VM. Do a bunch of setup. This includes either pulling your Docker container image, or if you don't have an image, you need to sort of install a bunch of dependencies, set up your environment. And once you've done all of this, you still need to manage your job, make sure it runs. You have multiple nodes in your cluster, which may fail. And so you need to manage their life cycles. And then finally, you have many such clusters, which may be running across different kinds of infrastructure. So naturally, there's a lot of complexity here, right? Like there's hundreds of choices you need to make before you even pick where to run. Uh, then you need to deal with availability, which is a recent problem that has started in the last two or three years where the clouds don't have enough capacity to serve the resource requests of, uh, of most AI workloads because they just run out of GPUs. And even if you manage to secure availability, you're still left with this infrastructure management burden where you need to transfer data, you need to sort of like set up your environment every time, and then you need to manage jobs, nodes, and clusters. So that is the complexity part of AI, but it's not just the complexity, but also the cost of running AI. Uh, for instance, here's, here's a chart which just shows how expensive it's gotten to train the most cutting edge model of, of the time. 
And this sort of reflects in how AI startups today are spending their money. Like most of the money goes into, uh, into acquiring compute resources for training their models. So our goal at SkyPilot is to sort of flip this and make AI very simple and also cost-effective at the same time. And the way we do it is our vision is something we call Sky Computing. This is our lab at UC Berkeley, which focuses on this idea of Sky Computing. Uh, this lab is a successor of the RISE lab and the AMP lab from which Spark and Ray have recently emerged as big projects. And our goal with Sky Computing really is that, you know, people write their applications as they do today. They use Docker, whatever um, frameworks they use. Um, but before submitting it to the cloud, there's like a layer, which we call the inter-cloud broker, which sort of takes care of like orchestrating and running across different clouds. And SkyPilot is our first instantiation of this kind of inter-cloud broker, where the idea is it handles all the cloud infra while laying an emphasis on saving cost and maximizing resource availability. And the way we do it is you write your program in whatever framework you're already using, or just like give us a container. And in addition, you state a resource request, like I need eight A100 GPUs, uh, submit to SkyPilot, and then SkyPilot takes care of like picking the best location, uh, provisioning your uh, job and the workload, and then running it, and then cleaning up any resources that may be uh, left after the job completes. Uh, now, when I say best, it can mean different things, but we start with the lowest cost and the most available region. Uh, I'll talk more about that soon. So here I was showing just three clouds, but really SkyPilot supports more than 14 clouds today. So you can basically write your job in one specification and then submit it to SkyPilot. And then SkyPilot seamlessly runs it on what we call the sky, which is a collection of all these different clouds. Uh, before we dive deeper into SkyPilot, just wanted to give you a quick overview of the project. So it's on GitHub, open source. Um, we have uh, a few contributors and uh, some of our biggest users are startups, um, which use SkyPilot to quickly deploy their AI training workload, training and serving workloads uh, on different clouds. And some of the major AI projects out there uh, use SkyPilot as a way to distribute their models today. For example, if you go to Mistral's docs, uh, one of the recommended ways of running on the cloud is through SkyPilot. Similarly, VLLM, which is a very popular inference engine, also recommends using SkyPilot to run on the clouds. So that brings us, brings us to the question, why use SkyPilot to run AI jobs, right, in comparison to other orchestrators out there? So one of the biggest things we lay emphasis on is like SkyPilot is squarely focused on AI workloads. So we designed our spec, our interfaces to be very appealing to an AI engineer. And the way it works is a typical ML project is usually composed of a working directory where you have some code, uh, you have some setup which installs some dependencies, and then you have a run section, uh, a, a script which basically runs the training itself, right? And on SkyPilot, the idea is simple. We decompose these exact different uh, components into individual YAML fields. So we have a work there. You say you state where your current code is. You state some setup section which says these are the requirements I need installed, and then a run section. But in addition to these, you also you can also state the resources you need. And this is at a very high level spec, right? Like, so this is just saying I need eight A100 GPUs. Under the hood, this can map to very different instance types. Like on AWS, it'll be like P3, 2X large or something. Uh, similarly on GCP, it'll be like G3 something. So SkyPilot takes care of this translation from resource type to the available instance type across different clouds. And in addition, it can also mount any object stores where your data set lives. For example, you can mount S3 buckets, GCS buckets, and so on. And that's it. Once you have this YAML uh, with just one command, you can launch uh, this task. And SkyPilot will take care of picking the best VM location. It'll provision that VM for you. It will ship all the code and data, execute your job, and get you the logs and everything. Uh, and the way, like diving one level deeper into how SkyPilot works, we lay a lot of emphasis on maximizing GPU availability. And what that means is, assume you just have 
access to one cloud, not even multi-cloud, just one cloud. What SkyPilot can do for you is it will go to the cheapest region first to find your resource request. So for example, in this instance, I'm requesting eight A100 GPUs. Uh, SkyPilot tries by going to US East one because that has the lowest cost. But if US East one is out of capacity, then SkyPilot will transparently fail over to other regions. So for instance, next it will go to EU West one, uh, which has a slightly higher price and then keep going on till it secures GPU capacity for you. So this, this kind of auto failover sort of makes the job of provisioning a lot easier for AI engineers because they no longer have to reason about specific regions. They can still state, I want to run only in these regions if they need to, but if not, then SkyPilot can take care of like automatically failing over across regions. Similarly, this extends to not just regions, but also different clouds. So when you say A108, uh, SkyPilot will look across different clouds for you. So it'll find that some of these specialized GPU clouds like Lambda Clouds, uh, Lambda Labs offers the cheapest GPU, so it'll start there. But if Lambda doesn't have capacity, then it'll go to Azure, then it'll go to GCB, then to AWS and so on. And the goal here really is to find you capacity wherever it's available at the lowest cost. And more recently, we have been working uh, on this idea of bringing any infrastructure, not just clouds. So the idea is if you have a Kubernetes cluster, you can plug that in and then SkyPilot will first try a Kubernetes cluster because it's a, probably like an on-prem cluster or cluster you've already paid for, uh, and then continue the same failover if it can't find capacity on a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so this I will skip. This just talks about the internal details of how SkyPilot works. Uh, we have an optimizer and a catalog with sort of like the optimizer determines with the lowest cost for your given uh, task and data. And the catalog basically stores what are the offerings across different clouds. Um, yeah, and then SkyPilot also allows you to use spot VMs. So spot VMs, you might know they are cheap, but they are very unreliable. For example, here's a graph showing when spot instances were interrupted on AWS across different regions. So you see there's a lot of interruptions, but these, in, these interruptions also allow you to operate at like a 3x lower cost. So what SkyPilot does is if your instance gets interrupted, it'll checkpoint your job and then restart it on another region wherever there's capacity available. So this sort of allows you to minimize your cost while still utilizing spot instances. Uh, so this is one example, like uh, about a year and a half ago, we trained the Vicuna LLM, uh, which, uh, which was a popular open source model at the time. And we fine tuned it under $300 using SkyPilot. Uh, and the idea was we, we used a lot of spot instances. And whenever there was a preemption, uh, SkyPilot automatically recovered it and trained it and moved the job across, across different regions. Um, yeah, and now that brings me to uh, the Kubernetes width of it. So, you know, we are really trying to go beyond just the clouds. And the idea is we allow people to bring in their Kubernetes cluster. So this could be on-prem or some kind of like managed resources. And if you if you think about it, like there's some analogies we can draw for SkyPilot between the cloud and the uh, cloud and Kubernetes. For instance, on the cloud we request a VM, but on the other hand, on Kubernetes we request a pod. Uh, cloud has firewall rules, and in Kubernetes we can define ingress rules or create load balancer services to expose uh, applications. Similarly, just like the cloud has VM images, we can use container images here and so on. Um, and the way we really make this work is um, we have SkyPilot create pods and we still sort of like expose SSH on these pods. And the reason for this is a lot of AI developers really like the ability to be able to SSH into their um, into the cluster or the machines that they're running. And you know, you could use kube control exec to sort of get into the same pod in the same manner. But that doesn't work with their existing tooling. Like they might be using VS Code, they might be using uh, TensorBoard and other applications which rely on SSH. So uh, 
we we do the same thing except we also like create a SSH connection to to the pods directly. Um, and some of our like we've talked to some of our Kubernetes users who use Kubernetes with SkyPilot, and um, here are some of the reasons they've told us why they use SkyPilot on top of Kubernetes. And one of the top one of them is like it allows them to speed seamlessly spill over the jobs to the cloud when the Kubernetes cluster is full. So, for example, if there's a small team operating on a fixed size of resources, they want to be able to sort of seamlessly burst to the cloud uh, wherever there's capacity available uh, when they need it. Uh, similarly, they really like some of the SkyPilot features, just like, just like I mentioned, the ability to SSH into their machines and sort of have this like job execution being taken care of uh, by SkyPilot. And uh, many of them find it to be slightly simpler to operate uh, than Kubernetes itself. Uh, so they like that bit as well. Um, finally, that brings me to uh, how we integrate with Q. So one of our users, um, I'm not sure if I can name the user, but they, they are very heavily invested into the GKE ecosystem and they really want to use DWS. And uh, the way they do that is using Q. Uh, and the way this integration is working right now is uh, SkyPilot, as I told you, creates pods. Uh, and we use the plain pod support from Q. Um, so like a natural question is like, why not use jobs or job sets that are exposed by um, Q? And the reason for that is SkyPilot is more than just a job because it's not about just launching one job. It's about launching a cluster that the user can SSH into any time. They can queue multiple jobs on the same pod at the same time. So giving those abilities sort of requires us to control the life cycle of the pod instead of just having it start and end when a job completes. Um, so given that we, we run plain pods and then the user inside the SkyPilot task YAML uh, specify the queue name or the labels that queue needs. Um, and then the summit that, and it works nicely. Uh, SkyPilot summits a pod, um, it gets queued in queue, and then queue admits a pod. And once the pod is admitted, SkyPilot completes all the additional setup that it needs to do on the pod. Um, we have a wish list for queue, uh, which may or may not align with your goals, but we we would love to see this happen. Uh, so uh, the first one is, of course, like first class support for plain pods. Uh, like it, it almost seemed like a, you know. Uh, not an afterthought, but it's it seems like something that's uh, secondary on Q's agenda to support plain pods. For example, enabling it sort of also requires you to jump through some feature flags and sort of enable it in like some initial configuration. Um, so we'd love to sort of like see first as support for plain pods. Uh, the second is um, we would also sort of like to see. Uh, all the metadata that's required by Q get consolidated under labels instead of getting split across labels and annotations. Uh, for example, here's one example from the Q documentation. Like uh, if you want to specify a pod group total count, uh, that goes under annotations, but the pod group name goes under labels. And for SkyPilot, which is an which is like a cloud or like infrastructure agnostic system, uh, it's hard for us to sort of add another field to our task specification to allow users to specify annotations. We already have one for labels, but we are really hesitant to add another support for like annotations inside our task specification. Um, so it would be it would have been like really nice. I, I understand. I can, the I can quickly comment on that. It's yeah. simply not possible because okay. labels uh, in Kubernetes have validation, and the validation doesn't allow us to use numbers. Um, as oh, I see. Oh, fascinating. I see. I see. Yeah. I see. Got it. That's, yeah, it's simply not possible, but at the same time, it's kind of, I don't quite like it because it's not a label, it's not an index. So labels are things that are supposed to be indexes. Mm -hmm. uh, and a number is not quite what is supposed to be an index. So it could could bring problems in terms of um uh the database underneath mm -hmm. yeah got it got it um yeah we, we 
yeah, we can we can add support for annotations too. It's it's just we would like all of these things to be in like one place. Like either maybe the pod group name can be moved to annotations. Uh, I'm I'm not super familiar with Kubernetes, so I'm not uh, not sure why some things are labels and some things are annotations. Yeah, it's um, whether it's an index or not. Mm -hmm. uh, labels have limited um, values that you can use. I mean, the regex is restricted mm -hmm. for the values. Uh, annotations is arbitrary. So it's like bigger amounts of data too. So much, yeah, much bigger mm -hmm. field. And uh, so the, the label is should, supposed to be like a key, just simple alphanumeric. But numbers by themselves are not allowed. <laughs> Got it. Um, yeah, yeah. So that was that was all from me. Uh, if you guys have any questions about Skype, I would be very happy to answer those. Um, also happy to discuss anything you you guys would like to talk about. Um, my usual question: not wearing my Q hat, but rather wearing my. Kubernetes hat is what can we do in job or in other APIs so that you would use that instead of plain pods? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, plain pods is hard in terms of um, retries. Uh, we've had a lot of issues like if, if a pod fails, what should we do? Uh, like it's it's hard to come up with a general rule what to do in that case and um it's kind of like if we if we were to solve it we would end up just rewriting another controller which is deployment or jobs or whatever else mm -hmm. so we really as q developers we don't want to do that because it's already solved <laughs> it's a solved problem mm -hmm. uh, or or it's almost solved or if uh, if we add the appropriate features to the specific uh, APIs. So yeah, that's that's my high level question. Uh, so what can we do to the existing APIs mm -hmm. so that you don't have to use plain pods? Um, so plain pods actually make a lot of sense for SkyPilot. Like um, I understand other projects might not makes sense. But for, for SkyPilot, it makes a lot of sense because um, the SkyPilot runtime, it sort of maintains the controller itself, which monitors these pods and then restarts them or like handles handles the lifecycle of these pods. So if a pod fails, uh, that's fine. We, we don't expect Q or even Kubernetes to be started. That's why we don't put it in deployment or a job. Uh, SkyPilot will take care of like restarting it because the pod might have failed because it might have been evicted because there's a high priority job coming in and so on. And in that case, we want SkyPilot to sort of like manage the spillover logic to detect that, hey, the cluster is full. Now is the time to sort of like ship this job to the cloud uh, away from like the Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so for, for us, pod sort of like satisfy the exact requirements we need. Like we, we explicitly don't want any kind of like failure handling on the part of either Q or Kubernetes. So that's why we don't use uh, job or we don't use deployments. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I mean, Q still has to have some generic handling of failures. Right now it's very simple, uh, the handling is when well, we wait for whatever created the pod to create a new one, um, which is, I, I guess, what, what you're doing. Um, but it can get tricky because like the pod could succeed or it could fail. Um, depending on that, you might wanna replace it or not replace it and kind of like, we kind of need an API that tells us, do should we expect a replacement or should we not? Uh, uh, and that's where it would become just hard to uh, come up with a expressive API that would work for everybody. So 
that's why we kind of decided okay, POTS is there, but it, use it at your own risk, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's an alternative if you really don't think that uh, any of the other APIs fit is to have a CRD in, cl in the cluster that is able to manage these pods in, in the cluster as opposed to uh, coming from outside. Mm -hmm. And then and then this can handle all the all, all the um, the pod management logic and Q can fully trust that CRD and controller as opposed to uh, having to communicate back and forth about retries. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's another option that, in my opinion, is better. Um, but uh, overall, like in the past three years, we've been working with um, multiple communities to improve the job API in particular to make it like as generic as possible. So I can solve multiple problems, uh, but uh, I think I, I kind of hear from you that overall deployments might be a better fit for you or replica sets or something like that. Um, so yeah, I mean, the question could be there, like what can we do? What can we do in the deployment or replica set to, so that you can use those instead? Um, yeah, things to think about. Uh, I think uh, supporting pods, uh, it is very limiting in terms of API because then if we need com to communicate more information then we need to add more labels, more notations, mm -hmm. it just becomes a neighbor uh, in, in that sense. Um, mm -hmm. the, the API by itself is limited, right? So that's why a CRD or an R API might be a better idea. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'm going to leave space for others to ask questions if there are mm -hmm. any. I have one question. Um, what is the do you want to go first? Um, oh, no, you're good. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like wondering. Thank you for this. It's very exciting. Uh, so, Remil, I'm just you. I think you mentioned about the spot instances and how you reschedule your, um, you know, training on different, um, on different clusters based on the capacity. Mm -hmm. So, I'm wondering how do you manage this in terms of the uh, the distributed training? For example, when I have more than one, uh, you know, gangs. To be available and basically you cannot run the training without all the gangs um mm -hmm. place yeah um that's that's an excellent question so we uh we do all or none or basically gang scheduling semantics on all our jobs uh so the way failures work is even if one node fails uh, we declare the entire gang as having failed and then we restart the entire gang uh now Naturally, the, there's a question, this is probably not the more, most efficient thing to do, uh, but we found that a lot of applications tend to fail, even if just one worker fails. Um, so we, we just decided that, you know, if one, one node fails, everything fails. And then we sort of like restart the entire gang in a different cluster. Makes sense. So basically you don't have any elasticity there, right? Yes, so it's not exactly. like, yeah, I see. I see. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so my quick question, um, you mentioned on-premises and I'm guessing you meant Kubernetes clusters on-premises. My So my question is, do you have any use cases where centers with, because you, you also said like you it's, it's extendable to different kinds of clusters. So do you have use cases where it's being extended, Sky, SkyPilot is being extended to different kinds of clusters? And if you don't have those use cases, do you see a possibility of that that being something that could be done too. So I'm thinking of like on-premises, more traditional like HPC types of clusters. Uh, I see. Um, yeah, that's, that's um, yeah, thank you for the question. I think uh, that's something we, uh, we discussed a lot. Uh, and yes, we definitely need to support other kinds of on-prem clusters as well. So one of, one of the, so we support Kubernetes as one way of doing on-prem. Another way we support today is VMware's vSphere uh, virtualization tech, uh, which allow, if you have vSphere installed, then we sort of work with that too. Um, but we we 
also want to integrate with Slurm and other uh, orchestrators that people have installed on their on-prem clusters. Uh, that said, integrating with Slurm was turning out to be slightly harder than we expected. Uh, so we sort of like put that on a back burner and like just yeah. integrated with Kubernetes that was much faster. So I'm, I'm guessing that has to do with the, the APIs and how how difficult they are to use. Um, so I'm I'm selfishly asking uh, my my center we we developed Flux framework which has very good APIs. So I'm wondering if that is. Uh, I guess the, the steps or some documentation or something or the process for extending is something you could share with me so I could think about the use case for Flux. Oh, of course. Uh, very happy to share that. We we actually have an entire guide which tells you how to integrate SkyPilot with something else. So very happy to make Oh, that. nice. Yeah. Yeah, you have good documentation. I was looking at <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. I didn't I just... realize you guys were out of Berkeley too. I, I guess I, I, I saw SkyPilot once. And I was like, ah, oh, the pilot of this guy. And and then I I didn't look at it again because I I think I just forgot. But um yeah, I didn't realize it came out of Berkeley. Anyway, <laughs> no. I, someone else can ask the question. I'm sorry, uh Shravan, you have a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So uh thanks, Roman. This is fantastic. I think one question I had on checkpointing that you mentioned. So I'm wondering uh if you had to do you control the way the applications are run or or rather, do you solve the checkpointing through some platform specific uh, solution? Uh, so checkpointing today is, um, so today we rely on the application to do the checkpointing because it's it's kind of hard to generally checkpoint containers and move them around. Um, so we, we rely on the application to sort of periodically write to a persistent store and then we sort of like, and then when the job restarts, it can read from a different, from the same persistence store and mm -hmm. continue. Uh, that said, we have been looking at container checkpointing um, and really trying to make that work. So it it seems to work for CPU workloads. You can use Creo to sort of like checkpoint restore processes. Uh, but with GPU workloads, things get tricky because there's a lot of CUDA state that is on the GPU and dumping that out and then loading it again doesn't exactly work. So um, we we are at a dead end there right now. We just haven't spent more time on it. Uh, maybe we can make that work too. Got it. Thank you. Um, I have some questions around fallbacks. I guess is your fallback mostly timeouts, or do you can you get any other kind of signal, or does it depend on the cloud? Uh, yeah, so the fallback is <clears throat> based on two things. It's either based on a timeout or sometimes the cloud APIs directly signal that, hey, we don't have enough resources or, you know, there's some, they, they're out of capacity on a certain region. And in that case, we continue uh, sort of like this failover across different clouds and regions. And 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 is the primary integration mode with each of the clouds is direct VMs as opposed to Kubernetes. Uh, yeah. Things. Yeah. Uh, either VMs or any specific unit of compute that they can provide. For example, there's this cloud called RunPod, which gives their own pods, which are not exactly Kubernetes pods, but RunPod's own pods. Uh, so we work with that too. Okay. Vanessa? So do most people that use SkyPilot like target a specific cloud or on-premises cluster, or do they have like multiple sort of registered at the same time? And then you find the optimal cost like across clouds, across resources. So it's it's the second one. Uh, okay, it's, so yeah, it's the second one. Uh, people usually have a bunch of clouds configured. So when you do that, um, what I guess what what algorithms are you using for scheduling? So first, like the the actual um, algorithm, like for, for actually, what what are you doing for your scheduler? What algorithm is the scheduler doing? And how do you have consensus? So like, are you using Raft under the hood or something else? Uh, so so right now, SkyPilot is not decentralized in any way. Like the optimizer and the entire logic sort of runs on your machine right now. Uh, so there's no consensus needed per se, but that said, you know, we, we do have an optimizer, which runs a very simple ILP to sort of like figure out the lowest cost across your search space. And, uh, once we do that, then we have a ordered list of, 
hey, these are the clouds to try and regions to try and resources to try in a specific order. And then we iterate over that till we find uh, capacity. Okay, so if I understand, I'm on my local machine. I have a piece of work. It's, a, it's an ML thing because everything's an ML thing and it, it wants A100 DPUs. I, I, I submit the YAML file. It then figures out the right cloud to assign it to, the right way to assign it. Then my work goes there. So what happens when something goes wrong with that job? Does it just continue retrying there or does it come back? And that, like, how would it come back and choose like the next best option of like a different cloud, for example? Right, so uh, this, this failover mechanism I described is for provisioning clusters. We have a separate API for running jobs. And in the job case, we, we do launch like controller VM, which is no longer running on a laptop, but like a VM, which is sort of, you submit jobs to it, and then it dispatches jobs to different clouds. And in that case, this controller VM sort of monitors your job. If it fails, then our logic gets triggered and then it's sort of like continues this failover across different clouds. Okay, so the controller VM is going, going to be interacting with other clouds and it's it because because the process on your local machine is gone, right? Yeah, yeah. So, okay, so does that mean that the controller VM has all your credentials to your other clouds too? Exactly, yeah. So all of your cloud credentials are sort of like securely stored in this one one controller. Okay, cool. I, is there a name for that design, or is it like is it like the one that we came up with? Um, uh, we we just call it the jobs controller. So the, the oh yeah, but you can't software. do that because Kubernetes already has a jobs controller, and Aldo's gonna get angry at you. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> yeah, uh, but you know, to summarize, there's just like two ways, two three modes of operation actually. One is you launch clusters directly from a laptop, and that case, you don't need a controller. Uh, the second case is you launch jobs from your laptop, in which case we create this controller. And the third is you launch services, uh, which are like real-time inference serving or whatever. Uh, in that case, also, we launch a controller, which sort of like keeps your service alive and up and running. OK, that's really cool. Thank you. <laughs> OK, uh, so I just have a quick note about Q again and, and uh... I guess uh, feedback. Uh, so if 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 you uh, find that you don't have enough information to fall back out of queue, let us know. Uh, like we can always improve the statuses or whatever is needed for you to be able to track whether whether um, there was not enough capacity. Because um, in queue internally you could also have fallbacks, right? You could have a reservation and have that. And then it goes to DWS or something else. So mm -hmm. and then those might have different um, timeouts or different uh, times of error. So yeah, let us know if if something is needed there. Oh yeah, that 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 would actually be very useful because right now the way we interact with Q is we maintain a timeout on our end, which is like if Q doesn't return me a resource in three minutes, then just move over to the next cloud. So if Q can sort of like signal to us that, hey, I'm still looking, or you know, there's a chance I'm getting capacity here or something, um, that, that would be- That should be in the workload status. Mm -hmm. So start there, but if it's if there is something missing or not it's not useful somehow, let us mm -hmm. know, open an issue, we can look into it. Uh, Alex, and that will be the last question for this topic. Um, thanks. Um... I had a bunch of questions around the cost optimization stuff, like how do you decide how much the on-prem stuff would cost or how much do you, uh, I don't know, do you know there's the special deals that people probably have set up if they have large enterprise deals with the cloud providers? And then also just, you know, sometimes, and. Uh, an A100 over here isn't the same as an A100 over here because the networking is totally different and the time to actually run the job on one uh, cloud provider is actually very different than over another another provider because of things well beyond just like which chip it's running on. Uh, how, do, you, do you consider any of those things or are you just looking simply at like, what chipset you're running, how much that costs? Um. Yeah, that's 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 a great question. So 
we we get our pricing information from the public APIs that are exposed um, by these clouds. Some clouds don't have a public API for pricing, in which case we just scrape their websites every day. So we have a separate GitHub repository, which basically uh, runs a GitHub action every morning to scrape all these websites and get like the latest pricing. Um, that said, so this is like public pricing and doesn't account for like committed use discounts or anything else you may have negotiated. Uh, we allow users to configure that directly in the catalogs that their local sky palette use. But you know, we don't have like a nice interface to sort of do that today. Um, and the third point about on-prem clusters, uh, we assume them to be zero cost right now to start with, because uh, that was just like the simplest way to model it right now. And you can change it. Uh, but right now, yeah, we we provide the user the knobs to sort of like control this pricing. All right. Thank you, everybody. Cool. I Thanks. will want to leave some time for Andre uh, to give us an update on, on I guess, Qflow v2. Andre, are you still there? I, I can do it quick, sure. Um, uh, do you need to share your screen or? Yeah, yeah, maybe I can share my screen. Uh, let me give you the permissions then. But thank you so much, uh, Romil, for presenting. If you have any follow-ups for another time, feel free to add a, an item to the agenda or open issues on GitHub <laughs> for both Kubernetes and Q. Yeah, so I think we just just to remind everyone, uh, my name is Andre. Um, I work at Apple and also I'm part of the Kubeflow community. So I've been there for the last almost six years, uh, mostly maintaining training operator, MPI operator, KT project, and uh, different part of the Kubeflow umbrella. Uh, so today we just want to give a little bit of dates about our integration with uh, job sets and what we want to do in, in our next V2 version for the Kubeflow training operator and MPI operator. Uh, so we've been, we've been working with Yuki for some time and also with John and other folks from the community to see how the spec might look like. Um, so let me just maybe share a few updates we have right now. Um, so first of all, we like what, what we have in place like we want to finalize this soon and submit the proposals to collect feedback from our like end users especially if using like you know Python jobs or mpi jobs in production um just to give you like an idea like to remind everyone like we want to unify uh all of the ml jobs under single crd called train job and this crd will allow you to actually use any type of framework with different capabilities with elastic training with mpi also with the uh, ability to use um, um, different scheduling policies. So the main motivation behind is we want to utilize all the features from job sets. And we also want to support all the features from jobs, which is like portfolio policies, success policies, um, and other things which are currently missing um, in the existing Qflow jobs. Um, so I think the idea is like we've been discussing how we can simplify it. So right now we see a couple of patterns from our users. Uh, so we see that the users usually use MPI or they use Torch Run to submit their jobs. And also they're using, you know, some other, you know, maybe they use directly Python. But the thing is like some frameworks maybe have some, you know, like uh, elasticity, like PyTorch, for example, support PyTorch Elastic, TensorFlow, supports this also, but in a different manner. XGBoost doesn't support any elasticity. Um, and we think about how we can, you know, uh, construct our API to make it very simple for users to, to submit the jobs. So I think like we come up with some, you know, some ideas initially. So I think like the idea is to reuse, like remove all of the spec which job set supports, uh, which is not kind of necessary for ML training jobs and fine tuning jobs or distribute training jobs and just keep what is actually required. So from the from our perspective, the only required parameters, it's the um, actually ML spec, which is very specific to, you know, some frameworks, uh, like for a PyTorch, for example, it is elastic policy for MPI, it is the MPI implementation, the host file or any other parameters for MPI, like number slots per worker. Um, also we introduce parameter like a gang scheduler. So this is right now, it's, it is not supported in Kubernetes. We have another cap, which is right now in progress to natively support gang scheduling. But the idea is like for some use cases, we want to introduce the gang scheduling with uh, scheduler plugins or Volcano. 
so users can schedule their distributing job only when all the resources are, av are available. It is like common use case for many, many people who use large scale training and they don't want to scale sch schedule the job until all the, for example, GPUs are available. Uh, also, we don't need like other parameters from like job sets such as uh, like failure policy on the job set level or success policy on the job set level. We believe that failure policy should be sufficient on the job level, at least from our like initial conversation, how people actually use it within ML training jobs. Um, and we keep this, you know, this template for people like who, who just want to like, they, they can basically define like similar to job set, they can define uh, every like every replica, like a master replica, worker replica, maybe chief replica or parameter server replica, replica for TensorFlow. And define the parameters here like pot fair policy, um, uh, back of limits, TTL seconds. So uh, some parameters which will, will be specific for, for ML training jobs. Um, so also we have another idea. So before I jump to the, the runtime um, implementation, like an alternative to this, any any questions so far? Um, so yeah. like we are replicating many of the parameters yeah. that we have in different controllers in this spec. How, like, it just, um, like if we want another another parameter, for example, and you're gonna have to add it explicitly to your spec here, right? Yeah, I think the main idea is to make it very specific for ML, right? Uh, I agree with your concern about like, because this is just, you know, uh, duplication of what job set has behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think like the main problem is sometimes like, and we discussed before, for example, for MPI, when you do the additional orchestration or for PyTorch Elastic, we also need to create like HPA. So for example, when we do PyTorch Elastic, we need to create HPA. So the thing is like, there will be some responsibility for C like train job controller, which we cannot delegate to the job set, right? uh for like very specific use cases when people just don't want to use just you know normal uh PyTorch run distributed training right um like and some parameters is not necessary for example job sets right now has the parallelism and stack parameters for jobs right like concurrency and parallelism so this is not necessary for MLEs for people who just want to do distributed training right mm -hmm. so they they only need to define as we believe replicas as we define here and other parameters like back of limits and active deadline seconds and detail seconds out to finish. Uh, but like, I, I think you can also, we discussed with you, maybe some of this could be, uh, do we really need to expose them? For example, you know, managed by, or, you know, uh, some of the parameters maybe not be required, uh, but this is like a minimal, we think it's kind of like, we can start with, right? Um, yeah, Vanessa, go ahead. So I'm interested in gang scheduling. So that's referencing the scheduler yep. plugins um, that has the pod group, but then yep. you you showed the cap. So are you suggesting to add, so I haven't read that. So I apologize, I haven't done my homework because I didn't know it existed. Um, but are you suggesting adding something like a pod group to Kubernetes proper, in which case this would become something different or an approach that, or having the pod group still built with Kubernetes proper, but then still uh, deployed as a custom controller. Like, are yeah. those two things related? And that's my question. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So, because like, I mean, Kubernetes by default doesn't support you know, gang, gang scheduling, right? So we kind of like try to push this cap forward uh, to support it by, by default. I think today we're just creating the pod group manually in our controller with the Volcano. So Volcano has specific pod group they needs to create and schedule plugins will also create the pod group. So we have this, you know, gang scheduling functionalities there. But this, I, I think like we, so the point is, the point is like for gang scheduling, like there is elasticity in, we have elasticity, we have a gang scheduling, right? So some frameworks in ML like doesn't support elasticity at all. Like for example, TensorFlow, right? You cannot define minimum and maximum number of nodes to define your distributed training job. However, like in PyTorch, you can do so, right? You can define elasticity, like where you can, you know, scale up and scale down your gangs when they're available or not available. So for that kind of like things, we we don't, like in this cap, for example, have a minimum, I think min number parameter, min number, like minimum, minimum number of available gangs, right? So for, you know, normal use cases of distributed training, usually minimum number, it's always like a number of rep replicas that user specified beforehand, right? Because they're always like the same. Uh, but in case of like white torch, uh, it can dynamically scale up and down um, based on the available resources. 
Um, yeah, but eventually we want to like reuse the the pod group from from this cap, right? But um, I think Yuki was working on this a little bit to push this forward. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes. Okay, so they're they're sort of two separate things because right now the gang scheduler is talking about the scheduler plugins co-scheduling yeah. yes. that has the pod group and the cap is thinking to the future of when Kubernetes supports. Okay. Yeah, okay. your yeah, you need to configure your scheduler to en enable scheduler plugins when you know Kubernetes, you know, scheduler to make sure this can, can can work. And we know some people who are using, you know, with this with Volcano or this with scheduler plugins, right? Yeah, Especially it's actually with... really cool because we have a custom scheduler. We have a custom kind of game scheduling plugin that that takes mm. this approach, and we could plug it in right there, and that's kind of exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that would be interesting. I know many people use MPI with scheduler plugins for large scale distributed training. Um, yeah, that's yeah. that's mostly our use cases. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> that, that makes sense. So, uh, just back to your point, Abdullah, about like the um, how why we replicating this again, like. For some use cases, uh, some of the policies is not applicable for the framework. So we just try to see how make it very simple for a user to, you know, like not learn a lot of about frameworks. For example, if we introduce elastic policy on the job set level, how we can like let user know that they cannot specify elastic policy with TensorFlow, for example, right? Or with XGBoost. So there is like some sort of concept how to make it simple for specifically Emily, right? Or, you know, user who wants to submit distributed training job. And at the same time, like they don't need to learn a lot about, you know, the complexity of job because job, job spec is kind of complex for, you know, for people who are like aware of, you know, machine learning, but not aware of how it works in Kubernetes. And we try to like expose the minimum number of API, which is required for ML use cases. Um, so uh, I know that you're planning to talk about like uh, the runtime. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is basically templates, I'm assuming, right? Yes. Yes. So. Yeah, no, I know. Yes, that's right. So, and this is still in progress, but uh, just maybe I know we have like three more minutes, but just quickly, we still like kind of try to construct specs. So this is more for users who don't want to like who don't want to manage the the replica specs, but who want to quickly do the fine tuning for distributed training. So the idea is like we try to maybe pre-create some runtimes for the for user, and try to have a spec where you know where they can just define what runtime they want to use. What model they want to maybe if they if, for example if they do fine tuning they need to take pre train model they need to take data set they want to do evaluation they want to export model to some you know some blob storage and also also they want to use the runtime so the thing is like from the user experience perspective usually runtime stay in the stay the same I think I talked about this before they only modify some you know packages they want to install for PyTorch right or they want to you know tweak their model a little bit. Uh, but because the runtime still stay the same, we kind of want to pre-create this runtime and reuse it in the trainer configuration. Um, and for this, yes, we can reuse the job set template as we discussed, because user doesn't really interact with the API here, right? Um, but the, the problem is like here, how to give enough flexibility and at the same time make this API useful, right? Because if we pre-create the runtime, how, for example, I can inject my custom code to this runtime, right? Uh, do we want to introduce some, you know, uh, an ability to like pre-build an image based on the runtime and then just create a, a, a train job? Um, so we still try to see how th th this could be useful. Um, but could, so are these presets from yeah. the Qflow project or or yeah. could, could users create their own runtimes? Yeah, we're applying like, to the similar to- Now we're yeah. talking kind of like two roles, right? At, at... Yeah. Uh, ML ops person and the, yeah. the developer, ML developer. Yes, that's right. So usually, yes. So this is kind of similar to KSR. Like KSR has a pre-created runtime they deploy within the, the 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 control plane. So we like they call it cluster runtime, right? Runtime reference, and we're planning to kind of pre-create this runtime coming from from us, like you know, runtime for hugging phase, or runtime for PyTorch, or runtime for TensorFlow. And they can reuse it inside their template to submit the job, right? Um, so they don't really worry about how to build an image, right? Because it is not very straightforward to even like build this runtime for MLS, right? And talk about data science persona, right? Um, we're not like aware of all these configurations. Um, yeah. So, any other questions? Yeah, I, I think like. 
like following up on this design pattern, uh, this is something I've actually been thinking about for serving. Mm -hmm. um, if we have everything in that, like let's call it like a, I don't know, a, yeah, you're calling training runtime. And the training runtime actually includes the job set spec, right? So all yeah. the complexity is hidden from the actual user, right? Like they don't need to care. And, and you, in there, you can define, for example, a blueprint or a, or a runtime, training runtime for PyTorch, right? Yep. And include uh, all that, like, you know, if you, you see, like, the, uh, if you go up, there are some things that, like, the workload owner or the ML engineer doesn't yep. care about. Uh, like the elastic, like the rendezvous, like it looks like cryptic stuff, like the rendezvous endpoints. So that's all, the, all of this is mechanical. It's not something that they care about, right? So all of these things you encapsulate in the runtime, and then they only point to it and say, okay, stamp out like a, a job from that template. But in the train training job spec, we only expose the pieces that they care about and wants to vary, uh, like the data source uh, for the training data uh, or the fact that they are actually want to create a PyTorch job and so forth. Um, yeah, I think the problem the problem will be how we can give them the same flexibility, right? If they want to, for example, configure the, the policies, right? Um, well, I mean, you have that template, right? Like the, the runtime that they can, okay. If they wish to, they would clone and change. Mm -hmm. So they have a starting point to start from. Uh, but how often do they want to change that? That's the question. Yeah, I think it's a good idea. So basically, like, you know, just have a job set templates, which is basically sitting on the cluster and waiting until they will be modified to use it. Within... But it's not just the job set template. Let's like, let's call them like, I, I like that, like the, uh, um, the training runtime. Yep. You have a training runtime PyTorch yep. and training runtime yep. uh, TensorFlow, right? This is an object API yep. uh, that defines how do I create a PyTorch job, right? Part yep. of it is going to be like the, uh, uh, the job set spec itself. Right, so we're going to describe in it that you will have so, and then with that, you don't really need to define replica uh, uh, spec and whatnot on the training job. Those are going to be defined in the training runtime uh, spec, right? And you will all you will you will directly define them in the job set spec in that uh, training runtime, right? And, yeah, but mm -hmm. yeah, and and there you can also define the HPA that you need to instantiate and, and so on and so forth. So uh, who who is going to control this spec? Like the, uh, the, the template, you mean the training? Yeah, the template. Yeah. So you, the, the nice thing about this is that us, for example, as a community, we can contribute those specs. And it's basically, the start, it's like you have a catalog, you have a starting point, mm -hmm. right? They can, uh, anybody who wants to use this starts from, they can clone it and, and tweak it if they wish to, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming for the most part, they don't really need to care about too much about these like little details, right? Like the, uh, now the, the challenge here is in the training job API, which is the API that will actually trigger instantiating the job. We need to define the points of variation, right? Like what exactly we need to tweak uh, when we instantiate a job from that training uh, runtime, right? Yep. So what, what do they actually usually try to tweak? And that API should be as much as possible, you know, agnostic to whether it's PyTorch or, or TensorFlow and so on and so forth. Yeah, so the question is... Okay, most yeah. of the PyTorch and TensorFlow is in the, in the, in the runtime spec. This is where the, the, the PyTorch or TensorFlow specific things will, will, will reside. Yeah. So your point, like, so you, so you think that we can make this template as abs as abstracted as to support every, you know, type of, uh, you know, feature, right? For example, for MPI, right? We need to create the the host files. Like, will it be like train job train job controller responsibility to create those host files based on the you know like when user wants to use MPI run, for example. Or yeah. Who... So basically, like that will be yeah. part of the you know. It, you, you will have a training runtime yep. object API for every type of job, okay? So mm -hmm. you'll have a training runtime, MPI training runtime, 
uh, PyTorch training runtime TensorFlow, okay? So yeah. those are things like they will define what you want to, like how you're going to instantiate an MPI job or a, or a PyTorch job or a, yeah. or a, um, a, a, a MPI job. The thing that would actually trigger instantiating them is a generic job called training job that will point to one of these, you know, run times and say, okay, I want to create a, an MPI job. So you, you have that, like the reference, right? Like you're going to re run time reference, you're going to reference the PyTorch job, right? And you have the kind is PyTorch. And now we have the full context. The, the training job operator say, okay, I'm instantiating a training uh, runtime PyTorch. It will actuate based on that template, right? It will create the job okay. set based on what, what is defined there. If you have a, an HPA defined in the spec, it will create it. If it is MPI, it knows, oh, I'm, I'm MPI. I need to create the secret and, 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 you know, mount a host file and so on and so forth. Um, just a quick reminder, we're out of time. Yeah. I'll be mindful. I'll leave a comment on the document. Yeah, I think it's good. Let's follow up on this. I think like we have like few things we need to like, you know, discuss about specifically, you know, like to support all the features. Okay. Uh, right. And just to see if we can make it generic enough. But I get your idea. I think like if we can maintain it somewhere, like and if people can reuse it quickly, and that will be that will be good. Um, but we also need to worry about the people who build, you know, API services on top, right? Will not really like directly interact with CRD, right? Um, it's our end goal for people to interact with CRD, but sometimes people like you know build the API services on top, right? Uh, like you know the maybe training service, right, or something else. Uh, but we can we can follow up on this one. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's fine. Sounds good. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody. That was great discussions. If you have any links, uh, please leave them in the notes. I saw Andre already did that. Uh, Roman, if you have the the slides, if you can share, you can, and you can post it in the in the agenda. That would be awesome. Otherwise, thank you everybody for coming. Um, see you next time. Yeah, thanks everyone. That was a fun meeting. Thank you. Ciao.